each speaker will get two questions. Um, from uh, Generally speaking, I will ask one and then Francesco will ask one. Uh, but to begin with, I'm going to ask two to Francesco. So the first question, Francesco, is, uh, is there any relationship between the use of ornamentation and the emergence of counting or numerical record keeping? Well, probably uh, there is one because we, we also know that uh, the, well, at least in the Upper Paleolithic, personal ornament were traded and uh, they sometimes they travel a lot. So one can think that when people was exchanging beads, they also had mean to quantify the, the, the beads, the, which does not mean necessarily um, counting, because of course there are other way to quantify things. Uh, counting is, a, in fact, is a quite complex um, uh, concept, but certainly there is a there is a quantification involved uh, when the beads were exchanged. So there, there is certainly a link. The and there are ethnographic examples, for example, from California, showing that uh, there is um, some form of quantification involved in in exchanging beads, particularly when they are exotic. So they they travel. Okay, excellent, thank you. Next question. There is a question for Brea uh, in which they, I mean, the, the person say, um, there are example of self arm, which would lead to scarification in non-human primates and other animals, it is a question. Uh, I will be particularly curious about bonobo and chimps. So, so they were asking if there are examples of that yeah. or they were talking about that in general. I mean, we do in some cases under extreme um, duress or extreme anxiety, there are cases sometimes of animals self-harming. Um, I believe that we do have examples of this amongst chimpanzees as well. Um, but I would generally call this a different type of, of origination or or meaning with this type of modification. Because while it does result in a form of scarification, again, it, it's not exactly as we're seeing in humans as a cultural marker or um, expressing some kind of information either to yourself or to others. Um, and instead, this is more so of a kind of response to uh, distress or something of that nature. Um, so while we do have some of examples of it, I'm not quite sure that it would fall under the same definition of body modification. Okay, the next question is for John. Okay, uh, what are the most effective identification methods in archaeology for distinguishing intentional from unintentional dental modifications? So there's a second part. And what is the estimated margin of error associated with those methods? <laughs> yeah, estimated margin of error. That's a very good one. Uh, in our recent book chapter in the um, Oxford Handbook, we basically say you want to use every source of information you possibly can and every type of intentional or unintentional dental modification that you find is going to have a variety of different ways that you can tease it apart. Um, there are margins of error and part of the reason we put these hypotheses out in the literature and we don't necessarily say what they are 100% concrete um, is because it gives it some um, room to breathe and other researchers a possibility to talk about it some. And actually, uh, Bria's talk brought up a really good point about that too. And part of the problem with finding these sorts of issues in the deep past is that maybe we aren't looking for them to begin with. And that's partially an issue of just the types of questions we've historically asked as paleoanthropologists. So some of us that have maybe a more anthropological lens or more of a bioarchaeological lens that also work on Pleistocene concepts and topics um, kind of bridge these gaps. And that's kind of where some of my work on Pleistocene intentional dental modification has come into play. The best lines of evidence, um, Bria also mentioned um, patterns are really nice. And this is one of the things when you have really 
large skeletal collections and you can start looking at patterns within larger groups and populations, you can have a more concrete notion of whether or not these things are definitive or more likely intentional. Um, unfortunately, in some of these really rare first case sorts of scenarios, like the ones I talked about, you put the hypothesis out and you see if it stands the test of time. Um, and so that's, that's the primary way we do it. And then in terms of the dental modification in particular, we're always trying to rule out various forms of um, dental wear that can occur through idiosyncratic sorts of behaviors. These can be anything from using your, your teeth as tools or um, even trauma, uh, tooth loss occurs through injury and so on. And so we have to go ahead and rule all of these out. So margins of error, they exist. Um, we try to be as honest with it as possible and provide a sort of differential diagnosis when we're working on um, the skeletal material that has, um, you know, uh, fewer skeletons or fewer samples to work with. Okay, the, the next question is for Rosemary and uh, Mesoamerica. The question is, is there any further evidence suggesting that permanent ear modification function as status symbols? Or is it rather the materials of the ornament that speaks to social hierarchies of the Mayan people? So first, um, it's important to realize that that ear modification, ear piercing is general throughout Mesoamerica. So it's not specific to the Maya or to any specific um, cultural linguistic group. In that wide span of time that we have, what the, the visual art is showing us and also in the classic Maya case language because there's the there's actual texts that talk about people wearing ear ornaments is that wearing an ear ornament is a marker of adulthood it's not a marker of status the status distinctions come with the material and possibly even the size of the the flare that is created on front so there's a big flat panel and there we can say that wearing jade ear spools um, later, once there's metal working, wearing gold ear spools is a sign of distinction from those who wear primarily fired clay, bone, shell, or other kinds of stone. The next question is for Shauna. Um, the questions are extending in length. We're at a paragraph now. So by the time we get to Paul, we could be really in trouble. Uh, the question for Shauna is, since not every Mercy girl has lip plates, are there any indications, past or present, for increased reproductive fitness in those with lip plates? Is there any societal stigmatization towards Mercy women who choose not to wear lip plates? Thanks. The, the first question, um, when it comes to, yeah, this idea of, of increased reproductive fitness, this is... I think um, more of a more more rhetorical than anything today. I think in the past, however, there was um, there was this association with with lip plates and and bride wealth and so cattle wealth, but today it's really more more um, rhetorical when women talk about a girl with a lip plate attracting more bride wealth. We have to remember that. Um, I guess I didn't I didn't mention this in my presentation actually uh, that bride wealth is actually fixed in in mercy. So this idea that uh, a larger or lar or lip plate will attract more uh, more cattle is actually not accurate. But it's also not entirely inaccurate to say that a girl with um, with a labrette might attract a, a good husband, a good cattle keeper, who may be able to pay that bride wealth up front. Um, someone who is considered um, poor in the sense that they don't have all of the bride wealth together to marry uh, may not may not attract uh, a girl with with a large lip lip plate who is also associated with being from a good a good family so i think today it's more it's more rhetorical uh, since um people will say oh you don't have a you don't have a, a lip plate you won't attract a good husband but in fact every girl will uh will go on to marry and every girl will eventually get the same amount of bride wealth which is 
38, uh, 38 ca uh, uh, cattle um, and a Kalashnikov. So whether that is distributed over time or paid up front is kind of how you determine then cattle cattle wealth in the sense. So uh, it's it's kind of one of those one of those myths that you'll you'll hear that a, a girl with a, a large lip plate or the larger the lip plate the more cattle. That's that's just not the case. Uh, but this also runs into the other question of, of stigmatization. I think uh, there is social pressure within Mercy to, and, and I think more so in the past than today, uh, for a girl to, to uh, pierce and stretch her lip. If you didn't pierce and stretch your lip, you would uh, be referred to as, as short like a warthog. Uh, if you have a, a nice large labret, you would be um, celebrated as, as uh, being tall like, a, like an eland, or, or um, you would even gain heroic status. So it, it's in the discourse that is used that this kind of stigmatization does come out, but I think the real stigma today is is what outside how outside view lip plates and that's where the real social pressure comes now uh to to uh, abandon the practice thank you we we have a very good question for ellen uh, the question is are there any genital modification that are known to affect reproductive success and evolutionary fitness I, I don't think that evolutionary fitness is an issue here. I once wrote an article called, uh, because someone had raised the issue that female genital cutting was a maladaptive practice. And I argued that I don't think it is because what it takes for a practice to continue is simply that it doesn't harm fitness and people will continue doing it. It doesn't necessarily have to improve fitness. And when you look at some of the cases, I looked at, I did some uh, work with the new air in Southern Sudan who had very high rates of childbearing and they did not do any practices with uh, female or male cultural or uh, circumcisions. And yet, in the north of Sudan, people had smaller families, but also very large families. And the what I was in the comparison, you could see that in South Sudan, the death rate was higher for children and infants at the time that we did this survey. And for the north, it was fairly good survival. So people were having very large families, even when the vast majority of women had infibulations. So it, um, I, I think it would be a very difficult case to make to say that it harms that. Now, that's not to say it never harms someone's reproduction because individuals may very well have injuries or scarring or infections that cause them to lose or reduce their fertility. So yes, it's possible, but on a population basis, I think you would be hard pressed to find evidence that it's um, damaging uh, it to any large extent. And can I just take this opportunity, since I have the microphone, to correct one thing in my talk. I was talking about the spread and the adoption of female genital cutting. Um, and I said something about when Islam had sometimes spread to a culture that practiced uh, or did not practice it. I, I think I misspoke. I meant places where female genital cutting was practiced very often Islam was capable of syncretizing that, bringing it into Islam and saying, yes, it's okay. And it shows that we are committed to um, the, um, the kind of sexual propriety that is expected of Muslims. So in case anybody heard that and wondered why I said it the way I did, it was, I, I misspoke. I meant cultures with uh, these practices. Thank you. Okay, next question's to Ryan. Uh, the, the question is, what you describe with foot binding is the ending of a heritage practice due to Christian missionaries. To what extent is their influence regrettable or wrong? I suppose the answer to that would have to depend on one's, uh, one's moral assumptions, one's normative theory, which certainly wasn't part of the talk. Um, <clears throat> I, the reports of those who are foot bound are routinely um that those those girls had a terrible time of it and most of the time it seems to be very unwilling 
So I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that it's obviously wrong. Um, on the other hand, one might argue, well, um, just as is done, by the way, as, as I'm sure Ellen knows, uh, in, in scenarios of genital cutting, that uh, it's a cultural practice that we should leave alone and respect and so on. So um, if, if pushed, I would, I would argue in defense of the cessation of the practice, but uh, it's important to note that it wasn't merely the, the Christian, they, 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 as it were, started the fire, but through the, this really interesting social mechanism of foot binding societies, um, uh, ethnically Han folks were able to subscribe and ensure that their offspring would be able to marry. Um, that was just crucial. Um, so it was, it was only the, the Christian missionaries did play a really important role um, and the role was necessary, it seems, at the time, but it was it was not the the most important uh, causal or social um, role in ending the practice. We have a question for Matt Lauder. Um, the the question is: Is there any concern about historical biases of gathering most of the data from urban metropolis? Yeah, I mean, this is something that I've um, written about a bit. Anyway, try, trying to access even the tattoo history in, of the urban metropolis is hard enough. Um, so to know what's going on underneath clothing and outside of, you know, very, very kind of major centres is very, very difficult indeed, particularly the further you go back in history. Um, so what I think we need to do, and I've developed some methodologies to do this, is figure out ways to look in, in existing non-urban data sets, things like prison and, um, you know, military data sets and, and see if you can kind of unpick some tattoo history from those. Um, but the other thing to say is, you know, when we're talking about the stuff I was talking about today, which is the kind of mainstream industry where actually the story is about the more visible end, sort of almost by exclusion. So, uh, you know the, the 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 thing I want to try and do, and I think this sort of goes to some degree with what Paul's doing as well. Actually, Paul and I work together quite a lot, as you may have noticed with the overlaps of our talks, um, is to kind of do what we can do and and fill the big bits of the story in first, which are also fairly un unrepresented, and then try and figure out what's going on at the margins. But it's it's a good and important question. Uh, well, the next question is for Paul, and it's a long one. <laughs> Uh, in our highly individualistic society, your clients come in under their own volition and motivation. This is in stark contrast to many uh, traditional societies where piercings are culturally embedded. Do you think that this affects the degree of invasiveness or types of piercings that are sought individualistically compared to those that are group norms? Gosh, this is going to test some of my undergraduate anthropology here. Um, so we all have we all operate under cultural pressure. Uh, there's a real, I'm glad Rosemary's not in yet since she was one of my professors. Um, we're all operate under cultural pressures. Uh, we, um, so we wanna be careful about thinking that somehow it's absent with us here in the West uh, or somehow we have like free choice. Uh, so, um, and that they do not. You know, that's the other thing. So um, it's a it's a really big generalization we want to talk about. It's easier to answer those things when we talk about specifics. The more specific we are with our with those questions, and the less generalized it is, um, the more I can give you an exact answer if that makes sense. So um, you know, here in the West, some families will pierce a baby's ears, and that's actually really contentious in the professional Western body piercing world, like uh, is culture consent. And there are people that I respect a lot that believe, um, well, it's your baby. And if you want to pierce its ears and that's part of your cultural practices and you have a right to do that. And then we have other folks, uh, piercers and families that think, mm, no, the, the child needs to be able to consent. And that's just ear piercing. That's just talking about ear piercing. Um, I think it's interesting to note that um, I did a lot of behind the scenes work on organizing the uh, piercing community in the UK. Uh, in 2015, they were faced with 
um, as many Western countries, there have been regulations put on the book because it's pretty easy to pass uh, regulations that are to protect uh, folks such as women. And there was uh, a law put on the books in the UK, the Anti-Female Genital Mutilation Act. And uh, sorry, I'm giving as long of an answer as the question. And uh, because they did not question their own biases, um, they adopted the United Nations language. And in that language, it said that any sort of harm, harm, because uh, we can go into that in depth as well, just that word, any sort of harm to the, the, the vulva uh, constituted mutilation. Um, the problem with that, of course, is it's it passed unanimously very easily because we aren't talking about our bodies. We're talking about those bodies, <laughs> their, their bodies. So, um, so what we're not talking about, female genital piercing that's done for dormant, except it's in the regulations. <laughs> so all of a sudden in 2015, all heck breaks loose and um, the NHS starts classifying female genital piercing as female genital mutilation. And it skews the records there and it makes front page news. Um, and it brings up this question of, you know, what is consent? What is body autonomy? Um, uh, Again, someone that uh, maybe on this panel once said, like, this is why they don't ask uh, anthropologists on the talk shows, because they never have quick, easy answers. Quick, easy answers are usually not very good answers. So I hope um, I expanded your thought on that, <laughs> if I didn't answer your question. We have a, qu a long question that is addressed to all of us, not to somebody in particular. So please uh, listen carefully, all, all of you. The, the question is, the emphasis of the symposium speakers today is centered on cosmetic and aesthetic aspect of body modification. However, evolutionary biologists are particularly interested in the physiological systemic correlates of body modification. For example, immune, endocrine, gastrointestinal, reproductive, etc. Can these speakers address specific significant physiological responses induced by the particular forms of body modification they presented? I suppose one thing we might point to is the effect on sexuality or the effect on um, sexual response. And since that might also have an effect on um, the success of sexuality uh, or the uh, interest in sexuality or the stability of relationships that keep, uh, that have some survival value for children. Um, that might be one approach to it. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, other, other things like um, tooth avulsion, I, I've just been struck by how many of the things we've talked about today are still in ethnographic uh, presence. I mean, I have I have seen uh, people, you know, living without their teeth, and I've seen a woman give birth thirteen on her thirteenth birth be reinfibulated. So the fact that we have seen so much of those things, I I think we know that there are many health effects because those often, in this case of circumcisions, those are often put forward, as Paul mentioned, as these comments on harm that have caused the World Health Organization to say it should all be banned, um, uh, male circumcision as well. Uh, I, I mean, they don't argue for male circumcision, but we can talk about potential harms for that as well. Um, so um, it, it would be, it seems to me, um, a very difficult thing to do the kind of work that would fully answer this question, because part of the effect of the negative outsider attitude is that these things have to be banned rather than studied. So to get the human subjects clearance to do the kind of research that would enable us to really answer a lot of questions about concretely how harmful is X or Y is extremely difficult. I don't have a solution to that. Maybe the others have something to say as well. You know, it's it's a it's a long-standing theory, perhaps even a trope that um, some traditional peoples will engage in activities, rites of passage, injuries, 
as a way of either strengthening the immune system or, you know, this is real or imaginary. It's again, I, I don't know how you go about proving it or as a way of the fact that you are surviving these ordeals would show some sort of um, uh, strength. Uh, and so it's, it's either a way of strengthening or proof of strength uh, and mate desirability. Uh, again, I, I don't know how much those, those necessarily hold up today, but they're, they're, they're well told. I do know that uh, a colleague of ours, Christopher Lynn, has done quite a bit of work looking at uh, tattooing and immune system response. Um, so he's done studies with, you know, participants from the U.S., but also participants from some Samoa in the South Pacific, um, and have generally found that there is a, a slight increase in immune system response to trauma um, for individuals that have quite a few tattoos and have spent quite a while in the tattooing booth, I guess we could call it. Um, it's not as though it's a, a major increase in immune response, um, but that there is a slight increase for those that have undergone this, you know, quite a few times. Um, so if that is something you're interested in, definitely look up Christopher Lin and, and his research for sure. Actually, it's, it's interesting because I, I shameless plug, I do a podcast and I did a whole episode about limbs work. And I, it's, I just wanted to say that um, evolutionary psychologists have different papers have argued that tattoos make people both less and more reproductively fit. So, um, you know, I take what you will but I have serious concerns about evolutionary psychology um as a as a set of methods because you can seem to use it to come to entirely opposite conclusions if you want to do that this was a really fascinating question um, um thank you to the person who asked that um <clears throat> just by way of foot binding I just wanted to share one uh fascinating paper in theoretical biology um that that hypothesized that um the so the process of foot binding led to extreme disuse of a variety of nerves in the feet. Um, sometimes those nerves were uh, more or less severed in the process through through the foot binding process or through medical consequences of the foot binding process. <clears throat> so uh, 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 McGeech, 1997, um, in the journal Medical Hypotheses, has a has a paper that addresses the the viewer's question. Does cord the paper's title is Does Cortical Reorganization Explain the Enduring Popularity of Foot Binding in Medieval China? And it's really fascinating. I, this is theoretical, but it's it's interesting and suggestive. So in the brain, if, if within the lateral post um, central gyrus, um, there are the somatosensory cortices, and one of them is the primary somatosensory cortex. Within this area, there are um, <clears throat> there are linkages to all the bodily organs that mediate any sensory inputs. <clears throat> so the tongue, the face, uh, any any skin, um, as well as other uh, other parts of the body. So <clears throat> tucked between the two hemispheres is a part of this uh, sensory sensory map. <clears throat> and it happens that the toe and feet are adjacent to the genitals. So according to McGeech, he hypothesizes, I brought it up to give you a little quote, he says, um, as times passed, as time passes, a uh, footbound girl's feet would atrophy and the area, the, the receptors of signals from these areas would de Um, This quote <clears throat> resulted in underutilization of the foot areas of the somatosensory and motor cortices, which in turn led to cross activation between the redundant foot cortex and adjacent genital areas in women's brains. <clears throat> so the, so <clears throat> you're probably familiar with stories in which um, those who lose a sense um, gain uh, some some uh, some extra potency in using other senses, um, and that's in in some ways this is this hypothesis is model on that. So basically, because uh, because receptors in the brain for feet and toes are adjacent in this uh, in this uh, primary somatosensory cortex to receptors in the genitals. Um, this this person hypothesizes that there is likely to be a uh, a connection between the widespread um, view the widespread sexualization of foot binding the eroticization of of the practice. 
Okay, um, I think we can probably move on to the, the next question, which is for Francesca. Um, humans and Neanderthals diverged over 500,000 years ago, and the earliest evidence for body modification is younger than that. So is there any evidence that Neanderthals modified their bodies? And if so, was it a shared behavior or independently evolved? Uh, well, there are no real uh, proof that Neanderthals modified their body, but there are no proof that modern human living in Africa modified their body at the same time while Neanderthals were living. But uh, what I mentioned in my presentation is that the, there are evidence of use of pigment, uh, red pigment in uh, Europe as in Africa, starting at the same time around 300,000 years ago and quite a lot of evidence of use of black pigment by Neanderthal after 60,000. So um, basically, uh, it's very possible that Neanderthal modified their bodies and that modern human in Africa, perhaps 300, 200,000 years ago, modified their body. Um, so in fact, um, um, it, and I think that probably there was more than human, as we see now, that they are not really modifying their body. So I would not um, consider that something that is necessarily linked with a biological divide between these populations, but rather to a specific cultural context, uh, in particular cultural trajectories in different regions. You have the next question. Yes. Uh, so is a, is a question for for Shona. They they say are the lip plates becoming more decorated in recent years to appear to uh, tourists? Where were they previously not decorated at, or not decorated at all? Yes, they were decorated in in the past, just with um, incised decorations and. Uh, but but the real beautiful lip plates in the past were were shiny, uh, had a shiny surface. That's not to say that they. I think it is more of a modern uh, modern uh, invention now. The 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 new incised lip plates uh, because from women's stories, uh, elderly women's stories, they will often refer to uh, a lip plate that is gilgili with a shiny surface, a uh, polished shiny surface as being the most the most beautiful. Um, but uh, there's no real historical evidence on on what the decorative patterns uh, were like, but they will talk about the decorative patterns today as being as being far more decorative than in the past with polka dots and so on. And in, in the past, it was just incised designs uh, with white clay uh, over top of that. Okay, thank you. So the, the next question is for, for Bria. I, I think if the question for John was a curveball, uh, this one probably counts as an underarm toss. So um, with the Australian nose bone dated to 46,000, uh, can ethnographic data such as Aboriginal oral tradition help with generating hypotheses for interpreting prehistoric evidence? So we may have to cut you off on this one, Bria, after about half an hour. <laughs> yes, I, I mean, absolutely. Um, especially with, as you stated there, the generation of hypotheses that we can then look for in the archaeological record. Um, and particularly when we're talking about you know, incorporation of oral history, um, you know, a lot of things that are talked about in, you know, folk tales and oral histories, you can find evidence for them fairly distant in the past. Um, so, so I think that it, it, we can't take it as a one for one, as though something that you see in the ethnographic present or the historical past, the recent historical past, is exactly what we were going to see tens of thousands of years ago. However, the generation of a possibility, you know, based on the oral history or the ethnographic record or modern day practices, taking that as a baseline for a hypothesis that you can then look and test with archaeological materials. Absolutely, that's that's something that I very thoroughly advocate for um, using this this indigenous knowledge and this indigenous history to interpret and understand and test ideas about the past, I think that that's a, an absolutely a, a way that 
academia and scholarship in these in these areas, I think that's the way forward for sure. So uh, I'll cut myself off there. You know, I could talk a lot longer. And if you ever want to talk more fully about that, I'd love to. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think that gets the main points there. Yeah, we, we have a question for John. Uh, the question is, could the loss of teeth during fighting have inspired dental ablation, ablation as a form of display? Um, I think this is this is one of those things that's um, going to be really difficult to say yes or no to. It's one of those things where you could suppose almost any reason for losing a tooth and another reason for someone to say that looks cool or that looks horrible or whatever. Um, there are lots of hypotheses regarding why you would potentially intentionally remove a teeth, uh, a tooth or teeth, um, but I haven't seen anything specifically about traumatic injuries through interpersonal conflict being one of those results. Um, and in that regard, I don't know of much evidence where we have tooth loss in the front of the mouth that, um, especially in the deep past, could be related to trauma very easily. A lot of the trauma that we see is going to be like pari fractures, injuries to your arms from defending yourself, or lots and lots of injuries actually to the skull. Um, and I don't know any studies that have been able to correlate, say, these sorts of injuries um, and on your skull to injuries in the mouth. And in fact, going back to one of the first questions, well, the first question that was posed to me about what are the best forms of evidence Often when you have full skeletons and you're trying to make arguments that ablation occurred at all, you look for injuries in the face and the arms as a way of ruling out that the teeth were lost due to trauma. And then that said, teeth are traumatically removed sometimes, but this is very intentional. And usually it's done with some sort of tool where you put it directly on the tooth and you knock it out. And some of the best examples come from um, actually Hawaii. And these are um, practices that have to do with mourning. And so these are adults that are getting this done rather than say the rites of passage that we look at in a lot of other cultures where the tooth removal is closer to puberty. So I don't know of any cases where we can directly relate it to interpersonal violence and generally we try to rule it out. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks John. Uh, so this next one is for Ellen. So the question is if both female and male genital modifications are some type of social signaling, is it advertised through other various means, considering that presumably only a small number of people are seeing the genitals? I have always thought that uh, this issue about what the genitals look like is an interesting one. A lot of people do argue that it's more aesthetically pleasing or, and today, as I mentioned, there's a big push for genital cosmetic surgery to make your genitals look a certain way. Well, there are cultures where the, the genitals are more visible during certain ages. Often women's genitals are covered, even in places where the breasts are not, there'll be some covering of the genitalia uh, for mature women. Um, so it's not like a lot of people are seeing them, but the key people who are seeing them or who pass judgment on the genitalia would be the, the sexual partner, or and in in some cultures where virginity is a particularly important thing there will be other witnesses like a mother-in-law or someone else who has to attest to the intactness of the hymen or the intactness of the infibulation of the labia in the case of infibulated women um so i think that um the question of are there other signals about it Yes, it, in, a, in a society where people have lived together their whole lives, like in a small community in a pastoral or agriculturalist society, people know when a circumcision has occurred because a celebration is held. Everybody remembers when someone's son or daughter was cut because there will have been some sort of celebration. The child, in the case of little boys, 
in uh, some of the rural areas of Sudan where I've been, they wear a little crown and carry a sword for a couple of weeks. And it's a big deal made out of the fact that they are now circumcised. And in, in the case of infant circumcision, where it's part of religious traditions, like the Jewish tradition, that's also a very well-known, well-marked, ritualized thing. So I think the ritual marks it, and the knowledge that people have of each other keeps that that showing. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples of, I think in the case of uh, males, however, there were in ancient times much more exposure of the male genitalia. I think it, it, it just wasn't that covered in many cultures. So people did look at the male genitalia. And there's one illustration we found for our article uh, that we wrote for the handbook that shows um, uh, defeated men in battle being having their you know they're killed now but their circumcised penises are being collected to be counted so showing that they are the ones who had the circumcisions were the enemies uh, so th sometimes it's uh i think the male genitalia may be more visible and of course in the case of um boys and sharing you know the view of each other's bodies or um uh, I think that's, it's not unusual for people to show that off. But again, I think there's a lot of uh, confusion about how obvious that is, because often, like a female sexual partner of a man may not know if he's circumcised or not, if she doesn't actually see his penis until it's erect, in which case, it could be a retracted foreskin or an absent foreskin. They don't look that different, since there's so much variation in genitalia. So I hope that answers the question. I'm not quite sure uh, what other markers would be indicated. I mean, we don't usually wear a sign saying I am or I am not circumcised. And uh, for those of us who work on this issue in contemporary societies and people are wearing clothing, it's kind of impolite to ask very straightforwardly. Um, mm -hmm. It might come up in conversation when people tell you about their childhood experiences, but you don't generally know by looking at somebody it, it doesn't, uh, like you would in the case of foot binding, where it is extremely harmful to gait and to, uh, one's, and, and to one's ability to move around. So, and the question of harm is, it, it's such a tricky one. And I, I really do, I'm pleased to hear people trying to problematize it because harm is, you know, what one person might consider harm and lack of consent other person might consider absolutely essential to their spiritual well-being. And so I think that uh, I, I don't think there's a very clear answer and uh, I don't want to be misunderstood. I do think there are some pretty severe forms of female genital cutting that I would really like to see go away or be modified um, over time uh, because I think they can be hurtful. But I don't think the answer is to call them harm and to outlaw them uh, with brutal punishments and jail time for parents and that sort of thing. I don't think that's effective. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I like the idea of counting penises. I will ask you the reference for that. The, 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 ne the next question is for Paul King. Uh, say, do pierced people have an outsider term for unpierced people? That would depend on context, place, time, speaker so in general in western communities today no not not as strong as like say in the tattoo community uh where there's like a, a a larger distinction the thing that's interesting about piercing is whether it's regulations uh you know county state or national level uh or individuals when you talk to them there's a huge cognitive disconnect of the ear being part of the body. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I'm talking to people all day long and they're talking body piercing, body piercing, body piercing. And then you say like ear piercing, it's like, oh, well, that's something else. And like literally in regulations and everything, you'll see this delineation, like the ear is magically floating outside the body. Like it's not systemically, if you get an infection in the ear, it's not going to affect the body. Of course it does. So, um, I find, you know, very anecdotally, daily cor correcting people in a gentle and loving way when they're like, oh, I don't have any piercings. I just have my ear pierced. Uh, 
uh, informing them that like no you you actually are a pierced person you have you have body piercings and the ear is part of the body right thanks paul um next question is for rosemary okay uh, I'll take a deep breath for this a long one how do the notions of uh, the shaping of cultural form and the readable body manifest themselves in other specific fields of archaeological anthropology can this thinking be applied to other groups so yes that's that's a that's a very simple thing this is actually not just a suggestion that mesoamerican people are somehow different than all other humans what we're hearing in all of the talks that we're given is the specific ways in different times and places that human populations uh determine what constitutes a human person a bounded interpretable human person when uh bria is talking about uh possibly uh, engaging with uh, Australian Aboriginal people's contemporary concepts. The reason we want to do that is because in any of these historically grounded populations, the way that people think about what's part of a body and what's not part of a body, are ears part of the body or are ears singled out for reasons that are specific to a kind of Euro-American discourse? Um, hair is you know, anthropologists have pointed this out for generations that hair has an uncanny relationship to bodies in some societies, but not in others. It, is your hair really part of your body? Or is it a kind of extra bodily substance? substance? So where does the body boundary exist is something that's produced as a, a form of knowledge in every human society. And we need to, as as, uh, as scholars, we need to present ourselves in front of each historical example without presuming the naturalism, either that a body is automatically the skin and what's inside it, or that um, the body... Uh, modifications that we're seeing even have the same significance. And I think that's something that's very important that Paul has, has emphasized. Um, there are some things that I would, I would say are pretty extraordinarily common defining a surface that there's some attention to, to delimiting surfaces for bodies. Something we could potentially say tattooing is often part of, but there's also distinctions there as well. So, um, so my my argument would be that for every human society, we need to ask these same questions. And uh, certainly, I've benefited from reading about other non-Mesoamerican societies, often ones that are better documented, and uh, and having a richer ethnographic context for these practices. Okay, thank you. Well, the, the next question is on the Chinese food binding. It's quite long. It says the theories you presented seem to deal more with the continuation of food binding as opposed to origin, modification that causes severe immobilization. Food binding or head binding appear to need seizable freeing of time from economic survival requirement and support system to both modify and then care for the person. Would the better theory of origin account for this necessary element? Yeah, I think the uh, the the competing theories, the two main competing theories have attempts to answer questions about the origins as maintenance and cessation of the practice. Um, <clears throat> in the case of the labor market theory, the explanation of the origin of the practice has to do with um, the fact that it appears to have been orig originating in areas of China that were known for textile production, and that meant that it was a it was a labor market feature. Uh, so kid girls could be put to work at spindles uh, effectively, making money for parents in those areas. The competing <clears throat> the competing explanation uh, in a in a more evolutionary vein suggests that origins. Are, are likely to have uh, arisen when they did be, and where they did, in part because <clears throat> they began in, in the imperial capital and among elites. <clears throat> so 
as the the person who asked the question mentioned that the significant body modifications um, <clears throat> like foot binding um, that required require time, care, um, support, and indeed um, they were very they were very costly. Um, <clears throat> it was quite different than performing a modification on your skin and leaving it alone for eighty years. Um, it required uh, uh, multiple forms of maintenance each week. And this is why, according to the evolutionary theory, the pro the the practice originated among very elite sectors of the the social environment. Thanks, Ryan. All right, this is a joint question for Paul and Matt. Okay, uh, do you believe there is a benefit to the distinctions between the two practices, piercing and tattooing? To what extent should they be seen as separate legacies or opposingly as historically intertwined? You should never ask Paul and I a joint question because we've uh, once given a four-hour response to a single question <laughs> together when someone asked us a question, we're in the same room. Um, you go first, Paul. Um, absolutely. Uh, distinctions need to be made and I would, would benefit by making distinctions between all sorts and all forms of body modification. Looking at specificity, I think, um, yields certain insights. Uh, but also looking at those same things cross-culturally uh, gains uh, and, and there's benefits with insights. And so it's not an either or for me and seeing the connections, particularly in the time period that Matt and I are looking at, uh, you know, when we're talking like, especially, you know, like 19th, 20th centuries where terms of technologies and types of communication and types of recording of these, we see the overlaps. There was an artificial separation that Matt uh, talked about in his presentation that I'll let him maybe touch on more um, uh, because there, there's lots. I mean, we could give a whole presentation just on <laughs> that 1977 separation. Uh, so there did seem to be natural overlap. Um, a Venn diagram is a really great way of looking at this, like people just into tattooing, people just into piercing, and then there's an overlap of people into both. Uh, so yeah, that's enough out of me. Thank you. But yeah, I, I think what's interesting is, you know, these two things get, have been lumped together. Um, most particularly as I sort of touched upon in my talk in that modern primitives book, but the way that they're lumped together by academics and often by mainstream culture is quite problematic because it misses the specificity of the difference in these communities and where they themselves diverge. But then at the same time, of course, Again, as both Paul and I talked about, there are moments when they come back together in ways that neither side of that equation I'm particularly comfortable with. <laughs> so, you know, cultural forces kind of have in the, certainly in the, you know, post-professional piercing era, like post the late 1970s, brought these two practices together into a sort of fairly singular cultural phenomenon. But I think it's more interesting, the, the, the differences between the two communities, and as Paul said, those, you know, where those, Venn diagrams don't overlap is I think more interesting and more in, more insightful from a historical perspective than a lot of the work that's been done to date which tr tends to treat them as entirely overlapping um you know I think I think one of the things that both Paul and I fight against is is both people saying that tattooing and piercing are coextensive entirely um but also people that say that they're entirely separate because actually there, there are these really interesting figures who find themselves in the same publications, even though a decade earlier they were, um, you know, entirely divergent. It's, 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 an inter it's an interesting because of historiographical question as much as anything else, I think. Sorry, if, if I may just... Really no, no, sure, sure, here it goes. Yeah, well, yeah. Eric, buckle up, guys. This is how it starts. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in some ways, I think it's even more interesting to look at how we lump together the categories. So like when we're talking about tattooing, we have to take into consideration the context, the, the, the people, the place and time, but even like where tattoos are on the body. So like hands, like 20, 30 years ago, this was like, the, you know, this was a job breaker. Like hope you, hope you have a company because you're never going to work again. And there's one, forgive me, the sociologist is escaping my, my memory, but they talk about public versus private signifiers. So things like neck and hands are very public and they're signifying responses from other people very differently than say something like what would be considered the most private would be the genital area. 
And so looking at the differences within, I think is, is very telling. And the last thing I'll say is there was a, a report that was done by really great researchers and they even included a body piercer, but the, the very question being asked, there was a problem in the research question. And they were looking at what were responses, um, self-reported -report, responses to female genital piercing practices in, in Western communities. And they were looking at, you know, you know, so how are, do you like your female genital piercing? Do you not like it? How is the healing? And the thing is, there are so many different types with so many different types of healing that affect so many types of sexual response. Some are more dormant. Some are like, who knows? Certainly this is for pleasure. That when it was overly simplified in that manner, like, like too far reaching and generalized of a question, as someone who does consider and is considered an expert in piercing, it what they yielded was almost like not very useful other than in the most generic way. Like, okay, lots of people with vulvas seem to like their piercings, but it didn't get into the specificity of like, no, not all genital, just like not all what I choose to call, Ellen, uh, female genital alterations, uh, traditional practices, not all of those are the same and they don't all yield the same consequences or benefits. So like, getting into the specificity of what these alterations are, I think is really important. Thank you. Tattooing is a medium, not a phenomenon. And I think piercing is too. We have a question for Mark and Brea. Uh, the question is, uh, is about the, the finger amputation. Uh, say, how do we know they are finger amputation and not people born without those digits? Perhaps is disability overlooked in the archaeological archive? Yes, disability is absolutely overlooked in the archaeological record. That That is for certain. In the case of finger amputation, we look for specific markers. So let's take the, the woman from Merzat Koba in Crimea, we have evidence of cut marks on the, the finger bones, the phalanges that remain. We have evidence of cut marks. We also have evidence of healing on the bone, so bone remodeling, suggesting that it wasn't something that was present since birth and instead was something that happened and then there was healing afterwards. So when we are looking at, at, at cases of finger amputation in the archeological record, that is generally you know, the types of things that we'd be looking for. Um, in terms of things like the, the incomplete hand images, within this hundred year long debate, some of the hypotheses that have been put forth and still many people believe is that we do have different forms of pathology or sometimes congenital conditions as well. Um, so so that's, that's definitely still within the, the landscape of scholarship that's being discussed. Um, but when we do have skeletal remains, we look for specific markers of a finger being intentionally removed rather than something that may have been missing since birth or some other form of pathology or disability. Yeah, thank you, though. Thanks, Bria. Right, got a, a question for Shauna. Uh, do the Mercy have a practice of kissing in their culture? And if so... How do those lip plate, those with lip plates, show or engage in affectionate displays? The answer is no. Uh, it's not a kissing culture. Um, displays of affection are uh, very much um, well. Flirting is by grabbing, grabbing a, a girl by the arm. Uh, this is this is the main form of of flirting. So if you're a girl with who's wearing, donning a large, beautiful lip plate. Uh, again, mercy, mercy rhetoric, they will say, oh, she's, she's able to scare off, scare off men. And, uh, and she's so strong that she can smash them on the wrist with her big fighting bracelets um, to deter them because of course she's such a proud girl that she will only attract those. But displays of affection, no, uh, has nothing to do with kissing, not a kissing culture. We have a question for Ellen. The question is, uh, can you comment on the ethnographic evidence, Africa as well as Australia, that male subincision sub increase sexual pleasure for female as well as male? 
I don't know of uh, information about about sexual pleasure for males in Australia. I, that's not my area of expertise, and I haven't come across that. Um, I do think that the idea is often talked about that some aspects of female genital cutting may have an effect on male sexual pleasure. Um, that's it's one of those contentious things that some research with men in countries where their wives are infibulated will say that there's been a lot of harm done to their penises by the struggle to break infibulations during first intercourse or to, um, you know, it, and, and maintaining uh, sexual relationships with someone with a very tight vulva. On the other hand, there's also a belief that some men really like that. And so women will sometimes say, like the, the woman, for example, who I saw have her 13th birth and be restitched, uh, she and her friends were telling me that they really like to be tightly stitched because their husbands love it and they'll give them an extra, you know, gold bracelet when they resume sex. You know, so they sometimes exaggerated it to themselves and to others that this was a, a very sexually desirable thing to do. And yet the research by men and women with men has sometimes reflected that they have very different attitudes toward that. So it's it's definitely not one thing. We know how complex sex is. It's a psychological thing. It's, it's engaged in what you're expecting, what you have grown up thinking is beautiful or desirable. Um, so I don't think we can make uh, that sort of comment. As for the... Um, the, the effect of sub-incision. Uh, my reading about it, I know there's some men who are intentionally doing to that to themselves now, and perhaps they have some testimonials about it. But for the, um, the, the basic effect of it is to widen the penis. Now, if that has a pleasant effect on some women, that may be the case. But we also know that there are many women for whom a large penis is extremely painful and uncomfortable. And a friend of mine who's a uh, gynecologist was telling me how, you know, sometimes uh, a woman who has a residual hymen that's tight will find sex with some men very, very uncomfortable, whereas others are perfectly fine. So, you know, individual differences. I don't know that we have any data on patterns of how that affects people. So, um, but again, I don't, I've never met any men who I've been able to talk to who've had sub incisions, perhaps some of the rest of you have. I, thanks, Ellen. That's great. Uh, next question is actually for Francesco. And the question is, are there patterns in how ornamentation was used differently? Or what types of ornamentation were used to signify within group social status as compared to affiliation within a specific tribe or cultural group? Okay, that is a, is a very good question. Uh, well, we, of course, it depends on the period because for a more recent period, we have, uh, you know, more evidence. But uh, if we talk about the Paleolithic, um, well, we... Um, we may assume that some ornament, well, well for, for example, we have cases with burials in which uh, um, we have a, a primary burial with exotic ornament. For example, in a case called the Saint Germain La Riviere, is a is a burial with uh, fifteen thousand years old, and in this period there is no uh, red deer in the region. And the, the, this lady is covered with more than 70 red deer canine that was traded. And at the site, these ornaments are almost not present. And there are other type of ornament made of local raw material. So this is a case in which we may assume that this lady had access to a large number of exotic items. Uh, and so that these exotic items were more important to identify her social status than for identify the um, ethnic affiliation of the people. And when we do a statistical analysis of very large area, like in the origination in the gravation, we see sometimes uh, quite elaborated ornament that are only found at one site, while there are other ornaments that are widespread within a region. So we may assume that those type of elaborated ornament that you only find at one site 
may have been worn by people having a special social status, while the other were um, used by more, let's say, ordinary people. No, thank you. I think the next question is with you. Yes. Oh, it's, it's for John. And say, uh, in your research, you explain the challenges of creating a universal classification system for intentional dental modification. Can you please elaborate on the advantages that will be gained by having such a system, a classification system? It's a, a great question. Actually, on that book chapter, Kenneth Tremblay wrote a lot about that. Um, and he wrote, um, he kind of summarized a lot of universal or attempts at universal systems. And what I think it gets back is to is pretty much responses from almost everyone here today, which is universal systems aren't necessarily as useful as they are to look at individual cultures, times, spaces, um, individuals, uh, context is everything in these cases. So we can make these comparative frameworks. We can use maybe ethno-historic data from one region or another to help inform us of possibilities when we're then looking at prehistoric cases for which we don't have direct access and so on. But um, making a universal system to describe the types of modification you could qualitatively do it, but you would lose probably most of the meaning um, for those specific cultures and so on, or or even individuals. So it, it's useful to an extent. We can use very general terms such as shaping, filing, inlays, uh, librettes, um, and these give us cues, things that we can talk about and we can all kind of agree upon and know what we're talking about. But um, in terms of kind of uh, uh, an overarching classification system that could get us somewhere in terms of talking about origins or dispersals or so on, I, I don't think it's as, as useful. All right, thank you, John. Uh, next question is for Ryan. Uh, is there anything specific about foot binding that can lead to increased risk, risk of osteoporosis? Uh, yeah, uh, there, the, the correlation between the two conditions is pretty well known. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, the mechanism uh, is, uh, is maybe a little up for grabs. There are a few things that happen uh, for folks who've been foot bound. One is like extreme muscular atrophy. Um, so disuse of the, the uh, a variety of muscles in the posterior chain is reduced and uh, the the result is uh, the bone mineral density changes as a result. So um, <clears throat> that that's generally thought to be a principal cause of osteopathic conditions consequent of foot binding. Thank you. Well, um, there is a, is a short question for Paul King, but in fact, it's a very big question. The question is, what do you think caused the revival of piercing in modern cultures? Well, let's pick a couple. Let, let's narrow that down. Um, and, then I, and then I can actually make it a pretty easy answer. So if we're talking about the more current revival, which would, I would mark from around the 1950s, and if we look at English speaking populations, I would say the ear piercing of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, prior to that, uh, it was there were more conservative views, particularly with the folks that would identify as white or prosperous. Um, uh, ear piercing was, you know, it goes through cycles. And uh, prior to that, uh, it was not in vogue for uh, upstanding uh, young white women to have their ears pierced. And when you have Queen Elizabeth having her ears pierced, which in that place and time meant it was world news, like it was it was around the world. Uh, because, and why does she have her ears pierced? Because it's the crown jewels and the crown jewels don't care anything about trends or fashions or whatever. It's simply like, you are the custodian of the crown jewels. And if you're gonna wear them, no, you're not gonna, change them to clip-ons <laughs> for pierced ears. You have to get your ears pierced. So once, you know, arguably the wealthiest, most prominent above any sort of critique of class, uh, once Queen Elizabeth has her ears pierced, then, and this isn't hypothetical, like 
and I'm not the first one to comment on it. Like you see, you know, jewelers who were very at the time in the UK were, you know, writing about like, oh my God, like it's 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 off the hook. <laughs> like we're we're getting all these demands for these young women that want to have their ears pierced. And then you have like Time magazine in the States talking about this new fad, this new trend among college girls getting their ears pierced. And then you have like you know, later issues of Time Magazine talking about how the younger sisters of the older college girls were wanting to have their ears pierced. And the next thing you know, you know, like by, you know, the late 60s, early 70s, it's 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 normative. It's it's part of the culture. And then, you know, you have other things going on with sexuality and uh, gay rights. And, uh, and then, you know, so then you find males having their ears pierced. And then the 80s, like males having both ears pairs. So like you can you can see that trajectory of how that grew from Queen Elizabeth. All right, thanks, Paul. Uh, so th this question is for Bria. And uh, being follically challenged, it's uh, appropriate for me to be asking. Uh, are there any modifications that involve killing of hair follicles? Um, I mean, removal of hair is very common cross-culturally. Um, you know, forehead hair, um, eyelashes, eyebrows, um, men plucking out their beards, like all of those things are are, are quite common cross-culturally. I'm actually not aware of traditional methods to kill hair follicles. Uh, I mean, obviously today there are methods, you know, laser methods and all of those things, but I've never come across anything um, that wasn't like a, a new modern technology uh, to kill hair follicles. Um, though, of course, you know, the, as as has already been mentioned, any modifications to the hair in trends, in removing it, in styling it, th that has been very, very common cross-culturally all throughout the past and today. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, we, we are moving now to the last question. We are quite close to the... Um the end of the question and answer session. And the last question will be for Hélène. Uh, the question is, major international organization, as you recall, condemned the um, genital modification, especially regarding consent. How does age play a role in body modification and what does consent mean at various ages? That's uh, thank you for asking that question. This is a very important one. And I think, you know, even in the discussion that I made of sexuality, a lot of times um, people will say, well, but I don't want to make sex painful for my wife. You know, they, they want to have a good life for each other. So the issue of consent is the very big one um, in this whole issue. Uh, right now, I'm working with an international group of uh, uh, scholars. We've been trying to come to terms with a lot of these questions is how can we have both respect for cultural heritage practices, particularly those that people think are part of their religious tradition, um, that they think God is expecting them to do this. This is such a powerful thing for people. It's not easy to let go of something you expect that you believe God expects you to do. So um, one of the things a lot of a, a lot of times they try to argue or the organizations who are against practices will try to help people see that there's debate about that and maybe god didn't really write or say this or whatever but they get into theological arguments but the issues of of, of informed consent to changes to one's body and bodily integrity i think cut across these practices throughout time and and the fact that people do them to children is a problem. That is, I think, the real sticking point is when if an adult wants to pierce themselves or circumcise themselves or be infibulated, we probably would agree that there's not a whole lot the rest of us, no matter how much we dislike it, can do about it. It's their decision about what they do with their, their body. But in, um, in, in some of the activists today like in Sierra Leone who are defending women's rights to um, in, have the in, initiations of the Bondo Society, that's a debate among the circumcisers. At what okay. age should people be allowed to do this and have be able to give consent? 
And does consent have to be part of it? And gr I think growing the, the growing consensus among those of us who work on this is that those are really important issues. And I really don't like the idea of children um, having, you know, having their genitals cut against their will. I mean, with the, the ear piercing is another controversy, as Paul pointed out, but um, that's so minor in some ways compared to uh, the kinds of things that might have long-term medical consequences like infibulation. So I, I do think consent is a, a key issue. When I turn that around and apply it to boys, I think the same thing. I, I had to make that choice in my family. I said, I, how can I not approve of this for girls and go ahead and watch children in my own family um, being cut? So we made decisions not to cut. But in the West, doctors don't know about the growth or the development of the healthy penis that's not cut. They're just not used to it. it more and more now they are. But in the past, they, they became worried about phimosis and we have to forcibly retract the penis of a three-year-old. Well, no, you don't. But that's part of the effect of this custom being so powerful that people really don't apply the consent and age issue to males in the same way that they insist on applying it to females. So I've come to problematize them. I don't, I think change is going to happen through a lot of these kind of discussions about the issue of, you know, what is really the right thing to do to be, to minimize the harm and maximize the choice that adults will have for how they want to live their lives and, and carry their bodies. So I, I guess I've expressed my my feeling that these are key questions. I don't have all the answers. I know it's very difficult to talk to um, to some people who believe God expects it of them and expect them to agree with you that age and consent are the most important things. But I guess I, I sort of feel like a lot of uh, young adults uh, or, or teenagers Probably 16 year olds are capable of deciding a lot of things about whether they go through initiation, but the international standard is 18, but it's not applied to boys. Thank you. We, we are running out of time, but Matt, do you want to say something? I see you raised. Yeah, uh, you know. yeah I sorry, just because this is a really live issue, right? So just in November last year, 2023, um, the Australian criminal, well, the New South Wales criminal court had to deal with an issue of this where someone was convicted as part of a suite of other things of um, practicing female genital mut um, mutilation that, on an that adult bore, woman. Dowdy Bora practices and also the adult practices. Yeah, were, were yeah. This, this this was a this was a this was a body modifier who was convicted and um, he, his case got overturned on appeal because they the Australian court said actually the text of that statute says people people can't have their genitals um, or women can't have their genitals altered but they ruled in in his favor in the appeal to say actually the statute only applies to um to adults but it, it's a really really live issue about where consent works and and, and what kind of consent you have not in america so much but certainly in like english jurisprudence systems in england in australia and in canada it's a really, really in the united states issue. as well in the united states as well we've had major things about this with the daudi bora uh, practitioners in particular but again the male and female inconsistency requires more discussion well, thank you for to both of you. I've been asked to give some word of conclusion at the end of this uh, question and answer um, period. And I would like to take the opportunity before handling things to Pascal Le Gagneux to thank the CARTA director for accepting our proposal and all the CARTA staff for the continuous help they provided in the last few months. I would also like to thank the sponsors of this symposium, the colleagues who have accepted our invitation and gave such a clear and well-illustrated presentation, as well as the public that has attended this symposium and particularly the attendants like me from Europe who have watched their screen at night after a long week. And of course, also to all those who ask a very pertinent question and as Mark has already mentioned at the beginning, all the authors of the today presentation and many others 
are also co-authors of the Oxford Handbook of Archaeology and Anthropology of Body Modification, edited by Franz Manning, who is also uh, listening to us, and myself, which we hope to see published before the end of the year. Uh, Franz Manning and I not only hope that you will read this book, but also are trying to organize on this topic at the very end of November 2024, a workshop in Paris, probably at the Musée de l'Homme. A call for abstract will be sent in a couple of months, so you are all warmly invited to come. And now, well, um, now on the scientific part, uh, of course, it's challenging in two minutes to left to, to draw firm conclusion from what we have heard, and a lot has already been said. However, it is clear in my view that today's presentation underscore the significant role permanent body modification have played in shaping individual, social, and cultural identities throughout prehistory, historical, and present times. They are an intrinsic aspect of the human experience. The diverse and rich range of practices in which they manifest themselves suggests that any potential drawbacks to physical fitness are outweighed by the profound benefits of self-expression and sense of belonging to a community with shared values. With that said, uh, I will ask the CARTA Executive Director, Pascal Gagneau, to present some concluding remarks. And thank you again, all of you. Thank you very much to all the, the two co-chairs and all the speakers for fascinating talks. It's it's clear there is much, much that we all need to explore and understand better about this phenomenon. Uh, it's my turn to, to thank the audience as well. And I'd like to uh, remind the audience that if you look forward to future symposia like that, we rely on your support. So please, if you enjoyed today's presentation, if that added value to your day and your insights into the human phenomenon, uh, feel free to scan this uh, QR code and support CARTA. We have uh, two symposia that are coming up uh, in the spring. We have a symposium that we co-sponsor with the uh, Institute for Human Origin at ASU, at Arizona State University, which will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the discovery of Lucy. Uh, and then in October, this will be a, a virtual symposium. In October, we will have an in-person symposium at the Salk Institute on construction, on how humans came to construct their world. It will be on architecture. Um, that will be in person and stay tuned for the details. We very much hope to see you virtually uh, in April and in person uh, if you're anywhere in Southern California uh, at the Salk Institute. Thank you all very much. Thank you.